Cyprus at the heart of a regional interconnected energy market. What would it take? The discussion is co-organized with PRIO. The panel will discuss two recently released studies, one funded by the Norway Cyprus Bilateral Funds, Cyprus's Green Pivot in a Regional Market-Based in Interconnected Market, and the Cyprus Institute study in collaboration with other international scientific and academic institutions for COP27, Large Economic Benefits from Regional Energy Cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East region, as identified by the Cyprus Institute's energy modelers. Please welcome online Jan Petter Noor, former director of gas strategy in the Norwegian Ministry of Oil and Energy, former chief energy analyst in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, former president of Hydro Russia, Konstantinos Taliotis, associate research scientist in energy planning and analysis from the Cyprus Institute, Christina Olimbiu, senior economist, Alma Economics, Maria Liapi, economist, Alma Economics. The discussion is moderated by Cleopatra Kitty, founder of the Mediterranean Growth Initiative. Hello, everybody. It's lunchtime, so thank you for being brave and staying in this room with us. And thank you for those who follow us on live stream. Thank you to the Cyprus Forum for hosting this uh, second year in a row discussion on energy and interconnectivity. And congratulations to the Cyprus Forum organizers for pushing through a very ambitious agenda this year. As Melanie said, I'm Cleopatra Kitty. I'm the founder of the Mediterranean Growth Initiative. If there is one issue that today disrupts our societies, our security, our markets, our politics, it's energy. There is a lot of noise around it and a lot of dense information around it. The price we pay for it, why we pay for it, getting to green, connecting to sources and markets, storing, saving, consumption. For Cyprus, there is an immense opportunity. It remains the only isolated market in the EU, burning heavy fossil fuel, and it needs to open up not only its domestic market for price and renewables, it also needs to connect its market to other markets in the region so that scale and energy potential grows. To make sense of it all, we developed this panel discussion with a lot of good insight. Cyprus Forum would be very happy to know that we have chosen this platform to release the findings of this unique new report funded by EA Norway grants, namely Cyprus's Green Pivot, with project direction by PRIO. And we are also presenting through Costantinos Taliotis the Cyprus Institute study on electricity interconnectivity for East, Med, and Middle East markets, prepared ahead of COP27. There are three key words I would like you to keep in mind as you follow this panel discussion. Interconnectivity, market transparency, and diversification. But before I introduce our panel, let me call to the floor our esteemed permanent secretary of the Ministry of Energy, Commerce and Industry, Mr. Marius Panagidis, for preamble remarks. Mr. Panagidis, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by thanking the organizers for today's excellent setup and for the kind invitation and, of course, the opportunity to address today's workshop on a such an important topic for the regional interconnected energy market. Let me start by saying that the topic you have chosen could not be more timely. At the given time, all European Union member states are intensively consulting on specific proposals of the European Commission through a regulation proposal that was presented recently. It is expected that political decisions would be made by the end of this month, tomorrow, is the extraordinary ministerial meeting in which Minister Pilidis is attending. 
regarding adopting emergency intervention measures to reduce the impact of high electricity prices on households, businesses, and industry. Climate change is having a profound effect on all our lives, and Europe at the moment, through the Green Deal, stands at the forefront of global efforts for our green transition. Today, these efforts are more critical than ever, with the European Union also looking for ways to urgently diversify its energy routes and suppliers as a result of the energy crisis caused by the war in Ukraine. Undoubtedly, the transition of Cyprus to the age of green energy requires implementing a multidimensional strategy. The strategy of Cyprus in the field of energy aims enhancing the security of the energy supply and lifting the energy isolation of Cyprus, the functioning of the competitive internal electricity market and the functioning of the internal market in natural gas, the strengthening of the role of consumers in the energy market and the reduction of energy cost for households and businesses, the provision of incentives to encourage private initiative from green investments by households, businesses and public bodies, as well as the promotion of new regulation and new emerging technologies such as energy storage. Furthermore, with natural gas having a vital role to play in achieving our 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Net Zero Emissions by 2050 as the most environmentally friendly conversion of fuel and potential raw material for the production of hydrogen, we can also leverage our strategic relation, uh, relationship with East Mediterranean, Mediterranean Gas Forum, EMGF countries, to engage in discussions to define and plan alternative energy routes and sources for the needs of the European Union. Cyprus can export up to 15 to 20 BCM of natural gas per year to Europe in the next decade, depending on the development options of current and future discoveries. In total, more than 2,100 BCM have been discovered between Cyprus, Israel and Egypt since the 2009 Tamar discovery. Of these, about 500 BCM are estimated to be still available for export. For Cyprus' short-term plans, the project of common interest Eurasia Interconnector will constitute a, de a decisive step towards ending the island's electricity isolation and consequently our independence on heavy fuels. This isolation has been a major hindrance to our economy's overall competitiveness, and we are now working hard to promote, in parallel, several different solutions. The project secures significant financing of 657.9 million from the European Union Special Fund, the most extensive grant that Cyprus ever received. In addition, the project is included in the Recovery and Resilience Plan, Cyprus Tomorrow, for 100 million financing. These grants are the result of the implementation of all stakeholders' hard work and cooperation with the Ministry of Energy and other involved ministries and services, and is the most crucial step for the project implementation. Let me emphasize that the total cost of the project is estimated at approximately 1.6 billion. The 1,000 megawatt electricity interconnector capacity project, phase one, is expected to commence within 2026 and will also contribute to the completion of the European internal market and to Cyprus energy security as well as decarbonization. East Mediterranean region has recently become much more proactive in pursuing and enhancing its energy goals towards a green transition. Cyprus, Greece, Israel and Egypt are all progressing with important REST projects and as such could be in a position to export renewable energy and use it eternally. In addition, it will be presented later on the importance of having multiple interconnections with other countries such as Egypt. Cyprus, Israel and Greece have much to gain from implementing the Eurasia Interconnector project. As an example, I note the studies carried out in the framework of our National Plan for Energy and Climate, which demonstrate that the electrical interconnection in combination with the use of storage system can by 2030 lead to the penetration of rest in the energy mix of Cyprus, which will exceed 50% currently 
which we have appro uh, approximately 20%. Finally, let me say a few words about the importance of a new package for the Repower EU that will enable the European Union to speed up the green transition and move towards renewable energy sources, energy communities, and green hydrogen. This package can make Europe more resilient and independent while providing sustainable, secure, and affordable energy for all. Research and innovation are critical sectors for delivering solutions for energy system transformations. It could be necessary to raise the efficiency of the whole renewable energy value chain and integrate sustainability and circularity throughout it. In parallel, we must develop and demonstrate novel and, disru and disruptive renewable energy technologies and energy storage solutions that will help us to achieve zero net emissions by 2050. However, before that, we need to build a capacity building strategy. International Renewable Energy Agency and IRENA and the technical support instruments from the European Union with Trinomics are working at the moment with Cyprus officials on capacity building to support the expansion of the national energy planning capacity, which includes also developing and updating the national energy and climate plan, which it is of great importance for, for future investments. Given the need to tackle both climate change and the energy crisis, I assure you that we are already working on this. We are working towards a healthier environment for citizens, new green jobs, emerging opportunities for green investments, and the production of cheaper and environmentally friendly electricity. However, this effort requires a collective approach and the involvement of all stakeholders. We hope that through today's discussion that will follow, it will become clearer how the existing tools offered by the electricity market rules from different regions and the operation of the competitive electricity market can be used in the direction of reducing the prices of electricity, always for the benefit of the customers, but also of the competition. I would be extremely Inter it would be extremely interesting, and I look forward to hearing the views of today's speakers on whether the current model can meet current and future challenges, whether and how it needs to be modified, and what additional policy measures we would adapt in order to reduce the likelihood of repeat of the phenomenon of energy price spikes in the future. Closing, therefore, I would like to thank the organizers again, and we look forward to seeing the outcomes and the conclusions of the meaningful panel discussion we are having today. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank the invitation. You, thank you, Mr. Panagidis. Very insightful. It will feed into our discussion. Thank and, you very much. And we look forward to discussing the green pivot with you at a later stage. Thank, thank you. you. So let me revert to this stellar panel. Hello, Oslo, Athens, and London. We have with us Ms. Cristina Olimbiu, Senior Economist, Alma Economics in London, Ms. Maria Lapi, Economist, Alma Economics in Athens, um, Jan Peter Knorr, um, former President of Hydro Russia, direct, former Director of Gas and Strategy in the Norwegian Ministry of Oil and Energy, and Chief Energy Analyst in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Oslo. Hello, everybody. And I have with me Konstantinos Talotis, Associate Research Scientist in Energy Planning and Analysis, Cyprus Institute, Cyprus's jewel institution of academic and scientific excellence for East Med and the Middle East. I will start with Alma Economics, who will present for us this new report, Cyprus's Green uh, Pivot. Alma Economics predominantly works for governments and multilateral institutions around the world who want to distill complex policy issues in practical, analytical, measurable outcomes for their citizens and communities. I will then proceed to Mr. Talotis, who will present his new study on uh, interconnecting electricity grids across the Middle East and, and East Med. And I will, last but not least, because I will have a lot of questions for Jan Peter Noor on his practical experience on gas markets, electricity markets, contracts, interconnectors. 
So you have 10 minutes at my economics. We'd like to hear a lot about the green pivot, Cyprus in Hello. the future. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so you can also see our slides. Um, actually, uh, there is a technical issue, so it seems that I cannot really share my screen. Um, Anyways, it's okay, I'm going to continue and we are going to explain the in words uh, uh, our research findings. So, uh, thank you, Lobada. I'm Maria Nabi and I'm an economist at Alma Economics. Alma Economics is a topic firm and analytical expertise with the ability to communicate complex ideas clearly. Uh, our team, in partnership uh, with the Peace Research Institute Oslo and under the auspices of the Mediterranean Growth Initiative, Explore the current state of the Cypriot energy market to provide evidence that can support the country's transition to a green and connected market based energy model. Uh, we conducted a thorough evidence uh, review to fully understand the current and future state of play in Cyprus and identify this practice from the Nordic power market, which is considered to be one of the world's most successful. Uh, me and my colleague, uh, Dr. Christina Miller, are going to uh, discuss with you some of our curious findings. Uh, some of the key features of the secret energy market to start with. Uh, first, about Cyprus's energy mix. Uh, Cyprus is currently heavily reliant on fossil fuels. Uh, its electricity is mainly generated by conventional sources, with only 15% from renewables in 2021. Uh, Cyprus, Cyprus cannot, cannot continue, continue to rely on fossil fuels to this extent. Uh, the, the country's current plans are to cover 30% of its electricity consumption uh, with renewables by 2030, mainly through solar power. Uh, when it comes to grid interconnectivity, Cyprus is not currently connected to any neighboring power systems. The Euro is interconnector currently designed and it will become operational in 2026. Will introduce grid inter interconnectivity in the region, supporting grid flexibility and increasing renewables in the energy mix. Uh, this Eurasian interconnector between Cyprus, Israel, and Greece will end Cyprus's energy isolation. Uh, then, then, according to evidence from August, Cyprus's electricity is the seventh most expensive in the EU. The, the transit free regulation of the electricity market in Cyprus will remain in effect until the new competitive electricity market model is implemented. And I currently suggest that this new model, the so-called network model, will be created by the end of 2022. Uh, as I have already mentioned, as part of our research, uh, we also explored the Nordic model uh, with a specific focus on Norway, and we concluded that Norway holds important lessons for Cyprus. Um, the, the notable model, the notable model, model sorry, that is about to be introduced in Cyprus is very similar to the Nordic model currently in place in the Nordic region. This Nordic power market is currently connected to power markets in the rest of Europe through physical interconnectors and through financial market integration. Over half of the energy in the Nordic market is produced by hydropower, Norway's main energy source which makes the Nordic market have a higher share of renewables in its energy mix than the rest of the EU. Um, I, I'm going to continue with some key regions and cities. And the first one is the use of renewable energy sources. Norway relies to a large extent on hydropower, while it serves as primary renewable energy source is solar power. Hydropower produces a significant amount of electricity without heavily relying on weather conditions, while solar panels uh, depend on the amount of sunshine received, which leads uh, to fluctuations with the power supply. Additionally, uh, Norway's hydropower production can be flexible due to its energy storage capacity, which is currently lacking in Cyprus. Uh, the, the second, second element, element is grid interconnectivity. Uh, Norway currently has direct electricity interconnections with other European countries, while Cyprus is only expected to connect with other countries when the Eurasian interconnector becomes operational in 2026. And last, uh, cross border trading. Uh, Norway shares a common electricity market with other Nordic countries, uh, having a common Nordic power exchange. The Nordic market is also interconnected with the rest of Europe. On the other hand, Cyprus does not currently have any plans for cross-border trading at any stage of the competitive market it plans to introduce. 
Uh, now, now, Christina, uh, we will continue with, with the rest, rest of our research, research findings. findings. Thank you, Maya. Welcome, Thank you. So, so um, I'm Christina Olympia, I'm a senior economist at Alma Economics. I will continue with, based on our findings, with the suggestions for the way ahead of Cyprus and the key benefits uh, of the green interconnected model in Cyprus. So, as discussed by Maria, Maria Cyprus partners are already targeting decarbonization, interconnectivity, and competition in the power market. However, to achieve a successful transition to a green interconnected model, there are some specific requirements. Firstly, the successful complete completion of the current plans to achieve physical interconnectivity, starting with the Eurasian interconnector already discussed by Maria. Secondly, Cyprus should accelerate the availability and deployment of energy storage installations due to unexpected variations in renewable energy outputs and dependence on weather conditions. Energy storage is necessary for achieving an increase in the use of renewable resources. Thirdly, Updating the secret electricity power grid to the smart grid, including smart metering, is also an important requirement for a faster and successful transition to green interconnected model. Another crucial factor is the completion of the full liberalization of the secret electricity market. Apart from the decentralization of the shares in the market, another important element is the transparent, easy and quick Said, trans, uh, sorry, provision of licenses for renewable electricity generation supply. The, the next requirement refers to the cross-border electricity trading. trading. As discussed by Maria, evidence suggests that participating in a common electricity market with other countries, as happens in the Nordic model, uh, is, is very beneficial. It can ensure energy supply security and lower electricity prices. Finally, uh, the, the final important element identified by your research is the successful implementation, and it was very important in the successful implementation of the Nordic model, is the transparency, is transparency in the market. Transparency can be achieved through various channels. For example, equal access to information for all parties involved in the power market is very important. And another transparent mechanism used in Norway is the, is the use of the common European algorithm to calculate market prices as transparently as possible. It's important also to mention before going to the benefits that Cyprus faces some challenges that are different from other countries in moving toward an interconnected market-based model. Firstly, it's a small country, so the number of potential suppliers is low compared to other countries, and hence the level of competition is expected to be lower. Second, due to its geographical position, interconnectivity is expected to be more costly and technically is more difficult. And finally, uh, geopolitical tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean region, region make it more difficult to achieve the level of interconnection that is enjoyed by Norwegian and by Nord Nordic countries in general. Despite these challenges, the benefits of the green interconnected market based model for Cyprus can be transformative. Firstly, such model will lead to the increase of energy generation by renewables, uh, especially solar and wind power in Cyprus, resulting in less reliance on fossil fuels and lower CO2 emissions. Additional interconnectivity will result in increased security of energy supplies, as we were discussed, and can also lead to large economies of scale in both power generation but also transmission. Consequently, based on, on these benefits, green, green interconnectivity can contribute to a substantial decrease in the cost of electricity. More particularly, based on the evidence from the literature, literature and under a set of reasonable assumptions, we estimated that the transition to an interconnected model could lead to each electricity consumer saving 200 euros per year of their energy bills. And that's the end of, uh, of our discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for um, the presentation. I could. I don't know if the audience could hear clearer, but the, you've done a, a good cartography of the Nordic model, the, the net pool model that Europe is uh, looking to head to and, and take uh, samples of the Nordic, the North pool model. And then you looked at where Cyprus is today and the work that it needs to do. There is a social aspect to if Cyprus get interconnected, there are more renewables, there is market transparency. There is uh, more climate resistance, more climate neutral, um, uh, cleaner air uh, for Cypriot citizens. Plus, there is a benefit in lowering the cost. And you've done a calculation that it reaches almost like a 200 euro per 
citizen if we achieve the interconnectivity, the market transparency, and the um, uh, tra transition into the green model. So thank you very much. I will head to Costantinos Talotis to talk to us a bit about his work on interconnectivity. Costantino, welcome to the panel. Thank you, Th and thank you for the kind invitation. Pleasure. Tell us a bit more about your, your work and wh where you see the, the scope. Yes, so um, just to give a brief background on the report and how the idea was born for this work. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of years, the Cyprus Institute has been the scientific coordinator for the Republic of Cyprus' uh, uh, climate initiative, which aims at coordinating climate action in the broader Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East. Uh, so as part of this climate initiative, uh, we undertook a small uh, literature review. We, brought, we compiled a report of what the current status of the energy sector is in the region. And we realized that there is a lack of regional coordination in terms of uh, long-term energy and climate planning. So we decided to uh, conduct a quantitative analysis, basically, to look at what the future is in regards to the electricity supply sector in the region before we look at the broader energy system. And at the same time, when we were starting working on this work, the Climate Compatible Growth Program, which is a UK-funded program uh, in which several top UK universities participate in, such as Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial College London, Universi uh, University College London, and so on. Uh, they called for scientific evidence by academia that uh, could guide and inform discussions in the upcoming COP27 in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So we basically published this work as a policy brief in this forum, uh, to help guide the discussions. So now going to the actual work itself, we know that the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East is very diverse. We have countries that are rich in fossil fuels, who are uh, net energy exporters, but we also have countries who rely on uh, fossil fuel imports, and Cyprus is one of those. So we wanted to see uh, what would happen if there is increased electricity interconnectivity in the region and how that could assist in uh, increasing the renewable energy share in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you a number, in 2019, the renewable energy share in the broader region was merely 12%. And if we, look, if we want to achieve the Paris Agreement goals, we need to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or 2070, depending yes. on the uh, degree target that we set. So we built a model looking at the 17 countries of the region, including Cyprus, <laughs> Greece, Turkey, and so on. Uh, and we developed four different scenarios. We developed a scenario where we only look at what the future is if we uh, keep electricity trade at the current levels. Mm -hmm. What would happen if we increase electricity trade further? And what would happen in each of these two cases if we have to reach net zero emissions by 2050? And the uh, outcomes of the analysis basically in a shell, they indicate that electricity interconnectivity leads to uh, cost-effective, more cost-effective achieve achievement of the Paris Agreement targets. For instance, uh, in the scenarios where we need to uh, reach net zero by 2050, uh, the cost of the total energy system is lower by 110 billion US dollars, wow. which is a large uh, number. It's, it's, on, it's only 6% if we look at the region as a whole, what it costs to provide electricity. But if we think of this as a small step towards the achievement of the Paris Agreement targets that can be coupled with smart grids, le electrification of uh, transport and so on, it's a good step forward in the right direction. 
Um, so after uh, we looked at the findings of the different scenarios, we also concluded to some uh, policy recommendations mm -hmm. that we wanted to relay to policymakers that will attend the uh, recent COP27, the upcoming COP27. And these basically are uh, identifying the need for regional coordination mm -hmm. in terms of energy and climate long-term planning. Currently, uh, countries only conduct their national energy and climate planning in silos, which doesn't necessarily include increasing electricity interconnectivity in the future. Mm -hmm. So this regional coordination is a, definitely a, a step uh, that needs to be taken. And within this uh, regional coordination, we will have the opportunity to identify the most cost-effective grid interconnection projects and the most effective renewable energy projects in the region that can help on one side countries to become electricity exporters, but they can help another set of countries to import electricity, green electricity, at a lower yes. cost. However, this needs a clear regulatory framework mm -hmm. that will be favorable for investors to invest not only in grid interconnections, but also in renewable energy projects and storage technologies. Since renewable energy is uh, projected to increase, storage technologies will also be needed for the stability of the system. And finally, we uh, also recommended that um, existing fuel and electricity either direct or indirect subsidies that currently exist in many countries of the region should gradually be uh, removed. So this would help uh, remove any distortions to the market that uh, currently prevents free electricity trade between the countries Country. of the region. Um, of course, our study is only a small step towards uh, planning in the long term for all the countries of the region, but we are uh, very keen in developing further this work and uh, assisting governments, either Cyprus or other governments in the region, in their, uh, in their plans to decarbonize the energy system. So you think the East Med Gas Forum could be a good first institutional framework on which there could be, I know it's for gas, but mm -hmm. it, we could add other uh, topics of that institutional agenda that could start a conversation or... Yes, definitely. Definitely it's a forum where, which, whose scope can also be expanded uh, to capture the entire energy system. And it's a good forum to start this process of coordinating regional actions uh, towards uh, decarbonizing the energy system. Well, thank you. And it's good to hear that more or less the two studies look at the interconnectivity as the way forward of opening up markets and creating efficiencies across infrastructure and uh, policies, systems, societies. Yes, of course, of course. Interconnectivity is a, a method of physical cooperation, let's say. Yes. And with cooperation, all countries in the region stand to benefit. And, p and create peace, hopefully. So thank you for that. So Mr. Noor, you, you have served uh, in different positions, dealing with complex issues. We are dealing with complex issues at this moment. Please give us your view on the challenges for Cyprus in the present energy political crisis in, in Europe. And please also help us um, understand how the Nordic countries in general, and Norway in particular, benefit from interconnections and green energy solutions because you are the lightning rod in, for Europe and for us in this part of the world. Thank you for that kind in, introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Because I've had some problem with the sound. But uh, as long as you are nodding, I, I take it that you re hear me. Um, 
first of all, uh, just a, a small thing. Uh, I'm also a pro I'm not only a former person. And you have been introducing me as a former so and so. I'm also a professor today at the North University in Norway, and I'm dealing a lot with uh, energy issues in the Arctic. So if anybody should be of interest, uh, would want to follow that up, uh, get in touch. Now, um, my introduction will uh, center on two issues, as was said. Uh, the consequences of the ongoing war and energy crisis on Cyprus's green energy integration into the European market. That's the first one. And the second one, are the Nordic countries possible models when it comes down to regional integration and energy systems? Lots of references have already been made to Norway and the Nordics. We will come a little bit back to that. I will cover both power and the gas side. Um, gas is not a pure renewable, but in, as you know very well, it's uh, in many ways a necessary but not sufficient element in an energy system. So uh, I will, uh, you have to excuse me for, for sort of dealing a little bit with the gas as well, but that has also been dealt. Some of you have already alluded to that. Now, quickly, because this is a huge theme uh, and I only have 10 minutes, uh, what is the energy war going on today actually about? And, and it is, and and it is really, really about, about gas. gas. A physical, physical lack, lack of gas, gas both, both globally, globally and regionally. No, I have it, an echo on my. Can you hear me? Yes, we are good here. We can hear you. Can you hear me now? We, yes, we can. Yes, because I have to remove, remove my, my, my microphone. microphone. Okay. okay. Um, so, so it's, it's really, really about, about gas. That's what this crisis and energy war is about. Russian a withdrawal of gas exports to Europe, 155 BCM per year. This leads in the first place, and that is important, both for Norway and for Cyprus and everywhere, everywhere else, a rush for new gas resources. LNG existing producers and new producers are actually being uh, really are trying to satisfy and to increase their supply. And uh, at the same time, as you also have been alluding to some of you, the EU is saying that uh, we are doing this, but at the same time, we are also supporting energy efficiency, green solutions to decrease overall demand for the fossil fuels. So they are asking us to keep two th thoughts in our mind at the same time. Uh, however, 155 BCM has been removed from the global market. And uh, so the world prices, and there are no alternatives that the Russians have for, uh, for selling that anywhere else. So it means that the global price for gas goes up and because of the European system, how it works, that also means that electricity prices go up. Now, the two last things I want to draw your attention to is really, uh, these high prices lead to great friction and great problems for governments. Governments must protect their population against hardship, and they have to spend a lot of money to actually do that. So you have a fiscal crisis on your hand in Europe, and you also, in the long term, and long and mid now, in the medium term, you will probably have a likely recession because real incomes decrease and unemployment will increase with corresponding political instability. So the situation is not particularly um, bright if you want to look at it in the short and medium term. Now, um, I want to sort of try to very quickly uh, present two possible energy futures for you stemming from this, because it's obvious to everybody that this situation somehow 
has to be dealt with and how it's being dealt with is actually of great importance for what we are going to talk about. So uh, the first one, the first uh, energy future is the dominance of geopolitical thinking at expense of climate thinking. That is really what you see today all along. The shortfall of gas is filled with coal, oil, nuclear, you name it, at least not renewables. And the, renew, the rush for new gas in Europe opens up new pipelines, including uh, pressures to increase production and transport from Eastern Mediterranean. Somebody was, somebody was alluding to that uh, initially, and I think that has to be very much part of what we are going to talk about. The problem with this world is, of course, that it locks in fossil fuels at the expense of uh, renewables. And the climate agenda is the loser. So, and also all prospects of green power integration falters. There isn't enough sufficient political stability and trust in order to actually initiate those kind of projects. That's number one. So that's one future. The second one is the situation where the short and medium term might be as above, but what you see in the long term is something which is much, much more positive and which is really should be the basis for what we should talk about today. There's a long term in this second energy future. There is a long run true transformation to a green energy system. system. New, New geopolitics. geopolitics that, that actually, actually put emphasis, emphasis on, on volatile fuels, fuels and uh, how they are the antithesis of uh, the dependence of gas on, uh, on uh, Russia, for instance, will become dominant and therefore the green future of Greece, of, of the connection, for instance, between Greece and Cyprus and the green development of Cyprus can take place much more easily in this kind of context. I'm spending some time on this because this is such a sort of dominant theme. Everybody talks about it. And as long as people talk about it in the present way, it's very difficult to actually have a kind of success or penetration of alternative visions, namely a green, a pure green uh, success. Uh, and like you want to achieve. So that is uh, the first thing I want to say something about. Now let's move to the Norwegian and the Nordic models. First of all, there are no models that Cyprus can copy. Every country is different, but the Nordics can share some of their experiences. So be careful of saying that there is a Nordic model that you somehow can actually uh, copy. We have had the, exactly the same kind of discussion when it comes down to governance systems in the oil and gas sector. And we have always said to everybody who wants to listen that the Nordic model doesn't exist, but what we can do is to give you some, uh, we can share our experiences with you. That's, that's what I want to say. So now the second part is Norway's integration in the power market. And, uh, and Northwestern Europe is probably the most integrated cross-country energy system in the world. And Norway has 17 electric uh, interconnectors and seven gas pipelines, 17 interconnectors, electricity and seven pipelines. Uh, and uh, this is, as you have been saying, uh, and you have been describing, and I will not go into this in much detail, but the, it, we were the first nation in the world who started a market reform in 1992, and we have created an international trading hub, Nordpool, which is very much uh, what is now being uh, the model for the rest of Europe. Now, let's look at a little bit uh, kind of critically on, on or there are four elements I want to draw your attention to from this integration in the power market. The first one is that, as you have been saying, all of you, there is a clear win-win situation from an economic point of view. I mean, so far, this has gone very well 
in the European and the Nordic uh, uh, area. And I stand by this very strong conclusion. It saves investments to cover peak demand if you can import the electricity. Increased security supply is a second kind of uh, consequence. It secondly helps Europe's green shift so it's not good, only good for Norway, but it's also good for everybody else. Improves the utilization of energy systems in North and Western Europe. The flexibility and how quick it, re it reacts to changes in the aggregate demand for, uh, for electricity is very much taken care of by the interconnectors. The third, and here there are some things you should think about. If you get, uh, interconnected with the European market, then you, as we found out, so far this has gone very well in Norway. Nobody really thought about it. Then on the 24th of February, we realized that we were riding a tiger. And that is suddenly we woke up to the realization that it was the marginal cost of electricity in the European integrated market that set the price. And suddenly, Everybody was subject to this market uh, discussion. And uh, for the ones of you who follow the Financial Times, you know that Martin Wolf uh, he has an idea about this market. So there, this raises some questions about should this market be changed? Should it be uh, in some way, um, uh, yeah, uh, at, at least when it should fundamentally uh, change or not, I don't think, but lots of people have been saying that uh, you need to make some changes to it. Martin Wolf, he says that you are in a war. In a war, you have uh, uh, very... Sorry? No, no question. Well, we're no, no, waiting for no, you no, to conclude. In a war, you, you have... Uh, you have uh, rationing, you have price controls, the market doesn't work. While the traditional IMF uh, solution and uh, the OECD solution to this is let the market do uh, what it's doing, but then try to help the poor people uh, who get uh, affected by the high prices. And then last thing, uh, ownership doesn't seem to matter in the market system. 90% uh, of all electricity production in Norway is public. 100% of it is, uh, of the transmission system is uh, also publicly owned. And it has operated within a market context like any other. So that's just one thing. I am uh, overstepping my time. I will not say very much about the gas system, except that seven major pipelines, 8,800 kilometers, and capacity of 30% of EU demand is something that is really a serious burden to, to carry for a small country like Norway. But I think we have been successful and uh, well-structured. The operator is 100% state-owned, GASCO, different from ownership, which is very much uh, in the pipelines are owned very much by international pension funds, transparent legal and regulatory framework, and fortunately, and here there are maybe differences from what you find in the East Med, there is a geopolitical context which is well defined and understood by all and accepted by all parties. Final takeaways. Russia will not win this any energy war, in my view, even if it will take time for the West to respond properly. Initially, the energy world will be dominated by geopolitics. There will be strong urge to find and transport more gas also from the Eastern Med. The green transition will happen, but later than we had hoped for, so, and I am optimistic about how Cyprus will achieve its aims. And I am very heartened by the kind of ideas that I've been, uh, uh, that you have presented so far, and maybe we can discuss some of them. But it will 
probably take longer than what we hoped for because of the war. So it really simply says that you have to deal with the war. You have to look at its consequences before, at least simultaneously, will while you actually talk about the future. And the Nordic experience, both in power and gas integration, should be seen as an inspiration and not a model to follow. Sorry, that was 14 Thank minutes. You. But, uh, but we have questions please. from the audience that we cannot take because I had promised the organizers we will conclude five minutes before we are due. So um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, two questions to Costandinos. Where is your report available? So for anybody who's interested to have a look at, it's on the Cyprus Institute website. There is a link at, on the Cyprus Institute website, but it's also publicly the policy brief is publicly available through the website of the Climate Compatible Growth Program. Um, and also we're in the process of publishing a peer-reviewed article which will have much greater detail. Okay, and uh, the green pivot, Christina, where is it? Uh um, I can answer. Uh, it's uh, published today, actually, both on the, the Alma Economic website, website as, as well as, as on the NGI website. website. Mr. Noor, we will continue this conversation because there's a lot more wealth of knowledge, especially on the um, markets and how markets influence geopolitics uh, on energy. But that would be for a future forum. Thank you very much, everybody, for your precious insights. I call this to a close. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Cleopatra. As always, amazing and on time. <laughs> Thank you.